Welcome to Moonbeaming, a podcast about magic, creativity, the tarot, lunar living, and more. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, and I'm so happy you're here. Hello, 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 everyone. I hope you all are having a beautiful week. I'm so happy to be here with you. If you are new here, if this is your first time listening, my name is Sarah Faith Godestiner. I am an artist. I am an author of The Moon Book and nine other self-published works. I am a teacher. I am a business owner, a designer, a psychic, and a professional tarot reader. I've been reading since 2012. And this podcast is a podcast where I talk about magic, art, creativity, business, energy, tarot, you know, other stuff, I'm sure. Basically stuff I know about and spent time doing. And I'm really happy you're here. This is the second season. We made it to the second season. I could not be more happy to be here with you today. I am having a fantastic May. It is May. It is one of my favorite months. I love this time in the Northern Hemisphere, and I hope that you're enjoying your time as well. Before I get going on this week's episode. I have a couple of housekeeping items I wanted to announce. I talked about it earlier this week, but I want to talk about it again. The first that I wanted to say is season two is a little different than season one because we are coming in hot twice a week. On Mondays, we've got a card of the week. We've got some energetic overviews. We've got a lunar overview to get you centered, to get you sort of thinking about your week. And then on Thursdays, we'll have a longer episode. This is me teaching. This is me sharing what's on my mind or an interview with an esteemed, fun, magical, and or cute guest. And of course, the guests are always esteemed, fun, magical, and cute, right? Okay, that's the first for the format. Secondly, we have a Patreon. Yes, we do. If this show has supported you, if my work has supported you, please think about becoming a patron. You know, over the years, I've had so many folks let me know, hey, your work your book helped me leave an abusive relationship, your work, your book, a spell, I ended up getting pregnant or we ended up buying a house or I got an awesome job or whatever it is. If I have supported you in some way, think about supporting me so you can offer up some monthly stability for me to help me pay the folks who help me create my work. Uh, and this podcast. So you can sign up for the Patreon at patreon.com backslash the moon studio. And you get a lot of fun stuff. You get a tarot spread a month, the ability to ask me questions for future podcasts, a ton more goodies, discounts, lots of other stuff. So head over there and sign up if you have the means. Thirdly, On the note of patronage, we're taking sponsorships for the podcast. Some episodes are going to have sponsorships by small businesses, by queer-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, artists, practitioners, and more. Obviously, I've said it before, I will say it again, I'm not going to align with orgs or companies I don't believe in. So, you know, you're not going to hear like a Walmart ad on this podcast. You know, um, I'm pretty discerning with who I choose to work with. And if you're listening and you're interested in sponsoring an episode or one or two or three or four or more, email us at moonbeamingpodcast at gmail.com. Season one has over 94,000 downloads. 
So thousands and thousands and thousands of folks will be listening. And, you know, obviously I'm sure the season is going to have the same. So thank you everyone for being here as I change and grow. Hopefully you are changing and growing as well. Big shift I've been cultivating is asking for help, being okay with receiving help and support and feeling safe to accept all kinds of monetary support for all aspects of my work and my energy. And I truly hope that all the shifts you are making are supportive for you as well. And you know, that idea of shifts to help you, of creating beautiful structures for your shifts really leads me right into the topic of today's episode, which is about the archetype, the hierophant, the card of the year. All of you know, this archetype is partially why I started this podcast, because I knew we were going into a hierophant year and I wanted to demystify this card. There are so many misconceptions about this card. This card is super rich. It's super layered. And I wanted to be able to have the opportunity to do a number of deep dives on this archetype for y'all. So, you know, we've got hanging with the hierophant again. Uh, That probably will not be the name of this podcast episode. I'm real bad at naming. So it might be, who knows? It just might be. But You know, episode 16 on season one, I did do an overview, a kind of basics episode on this archetype. So if you need a refresher, listen to that episode first. And also, if you're new here, I really recommend listening to episode 15 in the beginning of this year, where I channeled some of the themes of the year. And, you know, in general, I don't really listen to myself. You know, I don't listen to myself talk because, well, who listens to themselves talk? Sociopaths. That's who, right? Do I know? Like, I don't know anyone who likes hearing their voice on a voicemail or like whatever. Maybe singers do because it's like their craft or maybe like voice over artists do. I live in L.A., so I know some of those. But, you know, in general, I don't. Any who's. I did listen back to that episode to see what spirit highlighted. And honestly, it was really useful to me. It was also really aligned with some things I'm focusing on in my life. So if you want to stop this episode and listen to those episodes, episode 15, episode 16, and listen to those, it's cool. Like I'll still be here with, with my tarot talk. So, you know, I'll just be wait right here waiting for you. So, you know, I'm probably going to do three episodes on the Hierophant altogether this year. This is number two. Well, friends, I said before, I want to demystify. That's like one of my gifts is demystifying, is breaking things down in practical ways for folks. And also, it's the card of the year. These themes are popping up. And here's the thing, yeah? When a tarot card appears for us, whether it's in our card of the day, right? If we do a daily poll or a weekly poll, if it's a recurring card that keeps popping up over and over again, or just a card themes that really resonate with us, you know, maybe we keep running into the themes of the fool or running into the themes of the magician or, you know, whatever. These are invitations. These are messages to us, you know, and these invitations show up in a number of ways. One is it's an invitation to explore some of the themes that make sense for you at this time that maybe you're not exploring, right? A archetype can sometimes be this opening to help you to consider and explore and sink into energies that you haven't, right? If you're looking over there, a tarot card coming up can sort of tap you on the spirit or on the shoulder and say, hey, babe, look over here for a minute. Like there's something you're not seeing, right? 
So that's one. Another is like really practically, like what should I do some practical work around? And also it's an affirmation. It's an affirmation that you are transforming in some particular way. And the card is a mirror of the transformation. Sometimes we're so hard on ourselves. And also sometimes it's so difficult for us to see progress we've made. The tarot can be this really beautiful mirror. If the lover shows up, it can be like, hey, you're doing such a good job at self-care. You're doing such a good job at making choices out of love. Like we see you like good job. Right. And there's so many other uses. There's divination, you know, there's Uh, the tarot as a way for us to tap into energies that are on its way. Um, What else? I could be here all day. I wrote a book about this, or I wrote like a journal that hopefully is coming out this year um, about all of the ways. So, and it's not right in front of me, so I'll stop now. But those are some of the ways. They're invitations. They're calling us into a deeper attention. They're affirmations. They're like practical advice, like, hey, babe, here's what you got to do. And they're also maybe forecasts. You know, those are some ways I feel really comfortable about. And we're in the Hierophant year and we're seeing it. Like we are seeing these themes this year so far. You know, the very basics of this archetype are that it's a card about our beliefs, It's a card about what we believe in and why and how we're changing those. It's a card about structures and systems and all the ways they show up in our world. We know that so many of our systems and structures to the very granular, to the very large are based upon some people's beliefs, are based upon some people's imaginations. This is a card about our personal and our collective spirituality slash religions and how we interact with all of those themes. This is a card about healing and the different ways that we heal. And of course, the topics of life purpose and soul's expression come up with this card. The intangible made tangible. No big deal, right? No big deal. (laughs) NBD. And we're already seeing Hierophant energy all over the place in the collective. There's so much of this energy everywhere. This was so easy. This was like the easiest list for me to compile of reflections of this energy. We have the horrific insurrection in January, this really horrible display of fundamentalist belief systems, right? And how our American culture relates to those, both the compliance of and like lack of accountability with the insurrectionists, like how it's literally was a reflection of the system. We see the GameStop situation, this illustration of what happens when people join together to disrupt a system. And like, whoa, those fancy dude day trader financial guys did not like that. And we saw that, right? We saw how the system, the stock market, which is totally a belief system, and it's how a belief system shows up in tangible ways, like they didn't like that. We watched it with Meghan and Harry's critique of the monarchy, thanks Oprah, right? And again, how they, how the monarchy responded and how all of the conversations around that history and so on and so forth, right? And also there was this like other ripple effect of the veil being released on like, hey, things that look really good, like being rich or being famous, that's not going to solve your mental health issues. In fact, it's probably going to exacerbate it. So we have this like larger commentary on being famous or being successful in more traditional ways, like happening, you know, more and more with that. We saw 
the increasing attempts at unionization across so many different industries, right? I'm thinking about Gimlet Media uh, and sort of what happened with their Bon Appetit podcast. That was really wild. You can Google that if you're not familiar uh, with, you know, recent Amazon unionization efforts come to mind and really unionization in general, you know, um, thoughts around that changing. We've seen some like annoying announcements from the Vatican, like, um, hello, Vatican, we never asked you, apropos of nothing, right, uh, against like what they think about queer marriage. And of course, that leads into the measures of the GOP to introduce horrific anti-trans legislation in our country, which of course has ripple effects for all bodies, right? Not just trans and non-binary and intersex bodies, but for all bodies, right? Because once some folks can make laws around some bodies, they can make laws around all kinds of bodies. Yeah. See how this is all popping up? It's here font, babes. Some more. You've got some more. <laughs> of course, it's me. So I've got more. Don't worry. This is the only place all year I'm going to do a little background check. You know, we're seeing this increasing corporatization of the wellness and spiritual worlds, as well as the democratization of these worlds, and as well as the veil being lifted and more people becoming more discerning, more people being um, more open about some of the origins of these worlds, you know, and also like this greater education around being trauma informed, ethics, you know, and practitioners, um, how to interweave other modalities like somatics. I did not know what the vagal nerve was until maybe five years ago. And now like younger people know what this is, you know, and so on and so forth. And it's so beautiful. It's so incredible to share information about all these important topics. So many more folks are talking about neurotypical issues and mental health in general, that's very Hierophant. Because again, as we know, the Hierophant takes the unseen and makes it seen. And talking about invisible things, whether they be disabilities or histories of certain wellness practices, especially as it pertains to our life's path, how we organize our lives, it's so Hierophant. And like I said, 2021 is also this year where we are seeing overwhelmingly people critiquing the system, like the system at large. 2020 really showed us where there were holes and tears. Spoiler alert, they're everywhere. <laughs> you know, this is like, like the system is like one of those potato sacks when the bottom falls out. You know what I mean? You're like, this isn't going to work. It's like a Whole Foods uh, brown paper bag that gets wet. You're like, oh, OK. Or Trader Joe's where the handles just like fall right off. You're like, this is a bag. Sure. But it's like not really useful because there's a hole in it and the handles are off. Like that's our system. Right. And so now it's being so clear that the system isn't working for so many of us. And we also know who it's working for because they created the system. And we're in this massive process of transformation. You know, we see this with the increasing theme of abolition. Right. Um, and we're also seeing it in the breakdown of other particular systems like the family system with so many more women quitting jobs because of COVID, um, you know, and how that's sort of changing familial systems and like not in necessarily good ways, but it's changing. And I just read an article about how in certain areas, some minimum wage paying companies can't find people to work there because no one wants to work there. You know, even talk about the $15 wage is here a font, you know, canceling student debt is here a font because we have also this connection with the Hierophant to learning and education and worth and 
kind of getting what like it's like about reception and what we're receiving and we see more and more people are becoming self-taught they can make an income and a living from being self-taught so maybe we're going to see less and less people seeking a higher education and more and more people really encouraging a higher minimum wage higher wages in general uh and so on and so forth there's also this other hero fantastic yeah, I know I'm corny, like like the word I just made up, hero fantastic aspect gaining momentum, which I had to mention, and that's crypto. Like it doesn't get more hero font than an alternative economic system gaining traction. You know, we don't know what's really going to happen with crypto, especially as governments get more and more involved, right? But it does not get more hierophant than disrupting an economic system controlled by the government with a system created by other people, um, by the people, you know, um, making it more accessible theoretically. I'm speaking all in theoretics, right? It erases borders. Uh, maybe in time it'll erase exchange rates. There could be a day in the future for some folks or for many of us where banks are obsolete and we don't have to rely on banks to get loans or uh, to put our money in, right? Again, that's like theoretical. This is all pretty new, but this the, this is sort of the more encouraging aspect of crypto, you know? And here's more good news. More than ever, people are waking up to thinking about their soul's purpose. People are going back to school. They're moving they're figuring out like what their unique life's path outside of this over culture's influence of shoulds is going to look like. More and more folks are wanting to develop their intuition. They're wanting to trust their intuition and their own experiences and really um, create gold out of those experiences, you know, and who they are. People are talking about trauma. They want to heal trauma. They're talking about nervous system healing. They're talking about attachment theory. They're talking about consent culture. They're exchanging information on how to heal. You know, it's beautiful. Folks are banding together to create mutual aid funds and support one another in different ways. We have the farmers strike in India. That's revolutionary. We have the first ever indigenous interior secretary in the United States. People are unpacking and unraveling effects of capitalism, ableism, the gender binary, all of these things like inside of us, you know, internalized. And that then, of course, impacts the external, I believe. On a good day, folks, when I'm optimistic, you know, the pandemic has made more people more compassionate, more awake and more aware. I think we are sharing more intellectual resources like ever before. You know, side note, I think there's overwhelmingly more theft of intellectual property. And also we're sharing beliefs are changing. There's never been more interest in spirituality in a good way, you know, as an alternative source of healing. Folks are delving into ancestral healing and their ancestry in order to heal and find support. Folks are creating practices that work for them and them alone. Folks are understanding that someone else does not give them permission to heal or to become psychic or an artist or anything else they'd like to be, you know, that permission is inside. And that is so, so beautiful. Okay. Is that enough here about for you? Like, you know, I could be here all day, friends. You know, I could be, but I'm going to cap that for the collective and move on to the personal. Let's dip into some of the ways this energy is showing up for us personally. Obviously, the collective that I talked about, some of these are uh, probably rang a bell for you, right? And for us personally, this is going to show up in any number of ways, you know, not limited to a few of the ones I'm bringing up here, a huge one, a really big, important one is that so many of us are realizing that so much of or some of 
our reactions, our programming is out of this fear of being bad or this hope of being good, right? That is hella shadow hero font. Dogmatic thinking, black and white thinking, either or thinking, like we're parsing that out of us now. We're parsing out certain levels of our programming. And like news flash babes, no one is good or bad. We are bad and good and a million other things all at once, right? The fact is most things are a spectrum. Most things are this gray area. It's this gradient of not one or the other, but many things. Because remember, the card that comes after Hierophant is lovers. Lovers is like really getting rid of the binary. And so we're preparing for this, this year in the Hierophant. It's like if you're making unconscious choices in your life because you want to be a, in quote, good person, or there's this real fear of being bad, you know, like sweet babes, maybe examine some of those motivations, you know, because it is really intense. We are afraid of being punished or ostracized by other people, you know, like this whole wave of cancel culture really brings that up in a way. I'm not going to touch that, by the way, on this episode, but I just wanted to bring that up. You know, humans want to be liked. We want to feel safe. This is the most normal thing. So have like so much compassion for yourself and for other people. But we also know that these extremes of good and bad that are incredibly arbitrary, incredibly arbitrary on what is good and what is bad, create really disturbing outcomes for ourselves and our others. So, you know, again, we did an episode with Erin Johnson. I think it was episode... I don't know the number. We'll put it in the show notes with Erin Johnson. Um, But she talks about healing from like religious trauma and this belief of like good and bad. And like not just in the realm of relating to other people, but some of us are afraid to try new things that we really want to try because we're afraid of like being bad at it. You know, we, we, that's perfectionist stuff. And a lot of us are also really working on healing our perfectionist tendencies, you know? So as we do so, just be really gentle, really loving with yourself, really patient, you know, really compassionate and speak to yourself with love. Speak to yourself with spaciousness uh, as you kind of move through these energies. You know, another vibe, like I said, above, I'll say right here, this idea of like, what is our core belief system? What is it? What is our spirituality made out of? And what is our purpose? You know, if you haven't had an existential spiritual crisis yet, or questioned everything about your life this year, if you haven't seriously considered tearing everything down, are you even in a Hierophant year, babes? Like, are you even in one? So, you know, I'm making a joke. I know these things are really painful, which is partially why I'm making light of it. Like these things can be really intense and we don't have to burn things down. We don't have to tear things all up and start fresh, but you know, we can sit down and have a think about our beliefs, our spiritual practice in general, how we connect to spirit, how we define spirit, how we define our magic, what our life's purpose is now, because like we have many life's purposes, purposes, not just one. So think of like asking yourself, like, what's my life's purpose now? This would be a most excellent time to do so. I actually made a whole workshop about this, uh, that I'll talk about a little later, like to kind of help you with that about the Hierophant year. The, this archetype is so much about structures and deep listening. It's about prayer, inner wisdom, and what is hiding in plain sight. So for those listening who do feel called to inquire on these subjects, you know, take a cue from the archetype itself. What magic 
can you find hiding in plain sight? What mysteries will make themselves available to you now if you promise to be open to them? What is already there in your life that you might be overlooking? What have you always been interested in? What do you know about inherently? What comes easy for you? Or what do you love learning about or doing um, that like no that you would do no matter what? You know, I got really into tarot when I was 23 years old. I never thought I would do it as a job. I never thought I could really do it as a like J-O-B for so many years, for almost 10 years until one day I did. It was there all along, hiding in plain sight. It never left my life. You know, so you can ask yourself like, what has never left your life? It doesn't matter if you're actively doing it, but like what has always been there? What has saved your life? What have you been made to feel ashamed of? But is actually a super important, like core part of you that is ready to be expressed. You know, how can you gather your courage to begin sharing more of that part of you? So like if you spend some time asking yourselves these questions, if you try to answer them honestly and you can take some action around them as much as you can, Just try it little by little, day by day. This episode is brought to you by Haradin Vodka. Haradin is a brand new craft vodka, and there are so many things to like about it. It's gluten-free, it's made from local organic corn, and it comes in a -a one-of-a-kind hand blown bottle. And I love it, babes. There's this beautiful illustration of the moon on it. So, you know, you know that I love that. And what I especially really love about it is that they are a small women founded company. I've met them. They're really lovely. And they're intent on defying the restrictive norms of the liquor industry and also the culture itself. And that's why they named the brand Haradin. It means bossy, belligerent old woman. I love it. I love that so much. And I really do recommend checking them out if you're looking for high quality spirits brand that you can feel good about buying from. I've tried it. It's delicious. They What I love about them is they literally know the names of the farmers that are like making the corn and the suppliers that they work with by their first name. They really did their due diligence with their company. Paradin is currently available in store in New York, and it's online nationwide on their website, Haradin.com. I'll put the link in the show notes. And to stay updated on when they're coming to you and your state, you can also follow them on Instagram at Haradin Vodka, all one word, Haradin Vodka. I also wanted to talk about really practical, pragmatic ways that we can work with Hierophant energy this year. You know, the card of the year highlights certain themes so that we can collaborate with them and we can transform them in positive ways for ourselves. You know, everyone knows I'm like the most practical witch. So I love giving folks some practical ideas, because again, I want to demystify this archetype. At the beginning of this year, I made a workshop called Enchanting Our Beliefs, Embodying Our True Self, and it was all about the Hierophant. You can get that from the store. I'll put the link in the show notes. And I shared a talk about locating our beliefs, some really simple ways to begin changing our beliefs, practically and through tarot, how to think about becoming more embodied and the theme of embodiment itself. There's this beautiful meditation where you meet an angel or your spirit guide or a spiritual helper or your wisest self. 
awesome worksheets and content for you to dive in deeper around these topics. I definitely suggest you pick that up if you want to go deeper on these themes and concepts and learn from me in a much deeper way than I share here. And I'll put that link in the show notes for you. But I did want to share some excerpts from the workshop packet, some ways that the Hierophant can help us, that this energy can help us with in this year. The first that I think is really important and we see happening more and more is this idea of showing up, showing up openly and honestly, no matter the setting, you know, dissolving separations between public and private work and personal, looking for if we do work in like nine to fives or have a certain job, like wanting the people we work with to want to be working with us or wanting to be hired for us and our special gifts or our specific personality traits and not wanting to hide, you know, and just showing up, like not masking, you know, not masking who we are, not trying to put a positive spin when we're tired or, you know, not hiding what we're interested in or like what we're great at or what we're good at, you know, as much as we can practice this in our lives in our intimate partnerships out in the world in general, I think the more we can really sink into our own specific authenticity, you know, so that's like the first one. The second is definitely related to this one. And that is bringing our values and our ethics into our actions, our places of work, worship, communities, and lives in general. You know, this idea of right relationship and literally how we do that as much as we can. You know, there's so many people more and more that want to be in right relationship and aspects of their lives as much as possible. You know, they want to be conscious consumers. They want to work with organizations that align with their ethics and their values. You know, they want their friendships and their communities to reflect this, you know, Um, which absolutely begins with the Hierophant and blooms in the lovers. You know, we can really see this direct correlation here now with the beauty of the tarot, of the structures we create, then blossoming into larger communities and larger relationships. You know, so many of us really do have areas of cognitive dissonance and unconscious programming. All of us do. I am not trying to personally attack anyone, we've all got it, right? Duh. Because like there's so many people saying they believe in one thing and when in actuality, they do things that are very different, right? Like they say that they're a senator who's like a God-fearing Christian and then they show up doing things that are not okay, right? By the religion, Um, like cheating on their partner or really horrible things that I'm not going to say. Or they say they are a feminist, And they run a feminist business, but in actuality, they're running their business like a tech bro or like some weird patriarchal marketing scammer where they're just like stealing shit from other people and copying, pasting it and on and on and on. And for sure, there are so many layers here. There is no good or no bad. It's that spectrum again. Like we're all complacent. You know, there's all of these hard decisions we have to make, right? In this world, right? So I am not saying it has to be one or the other. But what I do think is you have to define what's valuable to you. And I think I've I talked about this in this theme of the year ahead, this idea of discernment, of going beyond. Friends, people can say anything. People can say they're a feminist or they're this or they're that. Behind the curtain, things are very different. So being discerning knowing what's most important for you and like moving from there in your own life and with other relationships, you know, like here's the thing on that tip. Part of why I created my own business was because I just couldn't function in so many workplaces because so many places of work are sites of abuse, 
you know? Uh, and I just like, it just got to the point where like, I was like, I'm not living out my values on this core level and it's really hard. And I never in my entire life dreamed of running a business or owning a business. Like I never, that was not on my to-do list for my life's path, but it really ended up being kind of like the only way I could be in alignment with my values because I could try to the best of my ability, implement those values in tangible ways, you know? And also I took a lot of that hustle mentality or that those tendencies of workaholism into my own work. And at first it was because I truly didn't know any better. I had that unconscious bias, you know, really. And I forgive my past self for that because really, truly, I just thought that's what you did because I was working in these very toxic workplaces where you worked 80 hours a week and you were like sort of owned by the company and your life wasn't your own. And this is like what we're taught. This is like how we in quotes get ahead, which is ridiculous because there's no ahead. There's no there there, you know, and I've had to do a lot of my own tangling and I have, and I am at this place where, you know, I have made a lot of pivots. I'm making more and it's been very interesting to detach level by level, you know? So like, I'm not exempt. I just want to be really clear. We've all had these layers and I really encourage you to look at places where your ethics and your values can be put into place in the everyday. And that's really simple. It's where we spend our energy. It's where we spend our love. It's where we spend our time and it's where we spend our money. Like these are all really basic things. And again, all of us have varying degrees of this. If you um, are an able on some level, in some ways, you know, there are other ways, you know, this, unfortunately, in this world, what I'm talking about is the site of privilege. Like even to be talking about where you spend your money is a site of privilege and you, and you all know that, you know, so it's, it's complex and it's, and it's, uh, it's intense. And also if more folks, you know, started having these conversations and trying to do that, I believe the world would look different. Here's another one. Uh, you know, how do you connect to the divine connecting to source energy or the divine more frequently or in a different way? developing intimacy with source or your magic, thinking about like, how do you feel when you're tapped into source energy, whatever that means to you? What does it feel like when you're in the presence of the divine? You know, do you need to make an altar? Do you need to become an altar? You know, write letters to spirit, write diary entries to your future self, you know, go out into nature. There are endless ways to connect. You know, another one that I think is important for this year is learning new things, figuring out how we learn, how we learn best, teaching new things, finding teachers, mentors, guides, or becoming one, you know, like babes, my babes, what have you been putting off learning? Is it jump rope, tai chi, SEO? Like, what is it? doing makeup really well. I have been putting off doing makeup really well for like 20 years. So maybe this is finally my year. I said I would do it last year in quarantine. I said I'd do YouTube and I just like never did. So maybe this is it. Is it magic? Whatever it is, try it out. And what knowledge do you have that you're ready to teach? Or if not teach and share, to integrate it into who you are in this really beautiful, solid way, like add it to your resume or like look for friends based off these shared interests or like, I don't know, like maybe you got really good at helping your friends apply for unemployment or for grants during COVID. And you can find a way to use that in other ways and to like let people know that you're good at it, you know, uh, if it comes naturally to you. And of course, I'm not talking about monetizing everything, by the way. It does go back to these other examples that I spoke about earlier about showing up authentically 
not selling yourself short, you know, not parsing yourself out or compartmentalizing yourself and sharing what you're naturally good at, gifted at and how you shine. You know, that's definitely a way to show up. It's like sharing how you shine. Another one that's really important here in this year are things that have really gotten a bad rap, (laughs) I think. Um, And that's consistency and discipline. Later on this year, I'm going to be teaching a class about business. I think I'm going to do it in August, so you can stay tuned for that. But on that tip, like one thing that served me really well in my business, it's really boring, but it's for real, is consistency. Showing up in the same way, in an authentic way, as best as I can consistently in my life, in my work, in my relationships. This requires this inner discipline that stems from love with an eye towards that future vision and not punishment. You know, I feel like we've been taught that discipline is punishment and withholding, you know, or like starving ourselves or something like I can't pee until I send these emails or whatever, like how we were taught in school, like we had to get a hall pass to use the restroom or at certain jobs. I literally used to have this pause. I'm laughing now because I'm so I don't like cry or something or roll my eyes. I used to have this boss who would get irritated at me when I went to the bathroom. He'd be like, where'd you go? You have to tell me so I know where you are. And I'd be like, "Um, that's weird and embarrassing. And definitely unnecessary for the amount of time I'd be gone for to go to the bathroom and like maybe get a coffee or whatever, right? But that's real. Think about these ways that we internalize this policing and we see discipline as like a policing or like a punishment. So, you know, I did go off road on a tangent, but I'm coming right back. So relearning discipline as this act of love, self-care, and like this way to parent myself in positive ways and to, to take care of myself has been key. You know, I believe discipline and consistency is like a major key to bring your dreams into reality, like showing up consistently, even if you don't feel like it, but as an act of devotion, you know, so often we only show up to pray or to do magic, or we only show up to spirit when things are going wrong, you know? And for me this year, I've really tried to underscore personally Like this for me is about honoring spirit and nature and goddess as much as I can every day, rain or shine. Like that way, it stops being a relationship of extraction and it can turn into this flowing reciprocal oasis, you know, Um, thinking about that. I want to be really clear on this discipline tip. For my fellow babes who have pain and chronic illness or who might be disabled, you know, being disciplined enough to care for yourself and rest, rest is a discipline too. And resting without guilt or shame is discipline and love as well, right? So like that's all there as well, yeah. Another one that you might not think is related but it is, bear with me, are harmonizing the spaces we reside in. This is energetic, metaphoric, and literal because the Hierophant is about being the messenger and the medium. It's about being the vessel and about the energy in our spaces, you know? So like our literal space on our body, you know, being harmonic, 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 being in tuned, you know, that's real. Another one is like just basic home improvement, you know, this year, home improvement or rearranging the spaces we live in. Also in our style, like style of all kinds, our communication styles, how we write, how we communicate, how we speak, like the way we speak or the words we use. And like aesthetic styles, has anyone else here like wanted to redecorate everything, like change your hairstyle, buy a whole new wardrobe? Anyone? Anyone? I have not, but I've wanted to. I mean, I can't afford to buy a whole new wardrobe, but I've wanted to. 
the Hierophant is so much about like what we're surrounded by, how we harmonize, what we're looking at, tangible things and how that impacts us and about space and about taking more care of our spaces in our spaces, you know, spending care in our bodies. And like, I want to extend this to the earth, you know, like taking care of the earth. It's our home. It's our original home. All of these things have been themes this year, you know? So thinking about that, if it's time for you to attend to some of those. And you know, like the last one, which is a reminder again, I think I'm just including because I need to remind myself, reminding ourselves of what is sacred and honoring that, you know? What is worthy of your respect and your devotion? You know, making time for that, having that be your guide. So these are just a few. I have this whole like list that takes up new pages, like that takes up two pages of ways to collaborate with this energy. And that is in that workshop packet that I created um, as part of the Hierophant workshop I made. And that's on our site on modernwomenprojects.com or the link will be in the show notes. So, you know, like real talk, if you feel called, focus on like just one or two of some of these suggestions this year and you will be in good spiritual fitness, in good spiritual shape, you know? Uh, Again, there's so many more suggestions in the workshop. I'm also going to do at least one more, probably just one more this year episode on the Hierophant. I want to talk about the fives. I want to talk about some other weirder um, teachings I've been in in this archetype. So you can stay tuned for that later this year. Okay, my dears, it has been so good to be back with you. I hope you've enjoyed my tarot talk. We are in a five year. I'm going to be talking about the fives. I'm going to be talking about more cards. And this was a reminder to me, honestly, as much as it might have been to you to implement and integrate some of these teachings of this gorgeous archetype. I will be back next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week, my babes. Protect your energy, protect your magic, share your love, share your magic. If you like the show, As you know, if you give us a five-star review, you are put into a uh, like hat, a proverbial energetic hat, and a random reviewer gets a prize. So uh, let us know what you like about the show with a five-star review, and you might win a reading with me or a goodie bag or a free um, entry into one of my classes and so on and so on and so forth. So again, thank you so much for being here with me. I cannot wait to be back with you again. And until then, sending you so much love and so many blessings. Moonbeaming is brought to you by The Moon Studio. It is created and hosted by me, Sarah Faith Godestiner. It is edited by the incredible Caitlin George Parker. Additional support is by Stella Hartman. Music is by Will Owen and myself. If you like this podcast, you can support us by going to Patreon backslash The Moon Studio and becoming a patron. You can give this podcast five stars wherever you listen and also subscribe. We'd love it if you could let one or two or three or four or more friends know about us and we accept all good vibes. Thanks so much for supporting us. Witches on planet Earth, not flying up to Mars. There is no planet B. There's a witch wherever.